Okay, so it is 1.45 exactly. I have exactly 30 minutes. I'm gonna try to keep this as short as possible so we actually have some discussion. Um, I am, I don't think it's rude if you just have a question midway, I will stop and answer questions as we go because I, you know, I think that's just a probably better way than just having me talk at you. So um, I'm gonna just get started. Uh, we're, we're here to talk about the RFP process. Uh, but first I'm gonna talk a little bit about Atten who sent me here. Um, you know, I, I, Atten is a full service digital agency. We build, we do user engagement strategy. Uh, we, we design user experiences to funnel users to conversions and then we implement the platforms uh, that see them through. So we basically try to find out what your users want, what you need from them and connect both of those needs. And we work with some really incredible cause driven organizations. Um, Atten works with higher ed, nonprofit, government, uh, clients, we work with a lot of libraries and museums. Uh, we don't have like a commercial arm and this other stuff. That's all we do is we just do work that matters. My name is Joe Crespo, I'm director of accounts. Um, so I, I do business development at Atten now, uh, which means I read a lot of RFPs, but that's not where my career started. I didn't start in sales, I started out as a graphic designer, then I became a developer, then an account manager, then a project manager, and now. Here I am, and there's actually a, a, a picture of my career trajectory online, um, which is, actually, this is not fair, because graphic designers do not deserve that. Um, salespeople do. Uh, the RFP process, that's what we're here to talk about. And I think any conversation about RFPs really has to start, and I, I know I said in the, in the synopsis, I'm not gonna litigate this, but I am. Uh, the RFP process has issues. It's, uh, there's some issues that need to be addressed. And frankly, there's just some people that hate RFPs. Um, uh, specifically, there's a uh, there's a, the co-creator of Playground. You know, so the RFP is this like huge document that is uh, just doesn't have a lot of information and doesn't really lead to great uh, outcomes. Uh, they, there's a lot more on that, uh, and I have a link here. And when I share the slides, you'll be able to go to it. Uh, unless you're really ambitious and you want to just start typing away. Um, and then there's also, there's a bunch of articles on Forbes about how much they hate RFPs. Um, and so there's some more, some more articles for you to read later. Um, and there's some valid criticisms, all right? RFPs are inefficient. Uh, if you have 20 people responding to your uh, uh, RFP, you have to read, if it's their 30 page responses, that's 600 pages to read that's uh, 19 vendors that basically are going to pass the cost of creating that proposal onto their own clients. And there's a great talk on um, how the RFP process is uh, sand in the engine. I would highly recommend seeing the five billion reasons to change the RFP. It's a reference to uh, the amount that the Canadian government spends every year in the RFP process. So the problems with RFPs, as they are, is that they're impersonal, right? They are designed to take the sort of human element and relationship out of the process and try to make it more of a um, <clears throat> uh, uh, objective uh, determinant. Um, they're really not designed to procure creative work. Web development and application development is a craft and create, connecting people is a craft and so it is by definition creative. Um, and oftentimes they, oh, did I do, oh, I just jumped all around. They value price over quality and innovation. Um, there's a great example of this. That, uh, if you ask somebody to build you a blog, uh, they can actually build you a blog in 15 minutes using Medium, just create an account, it doesn't take long. Or you could do Snowfall, which is I think in 2013, New York Times, a single blog post, they spent a thousand hours on this thing. Um, and if, you've, if you're not familiar with Snowfall, this is like um, all of 20, every website that launched in 2014 and 2015 was like a love poem to Snowfall. So Snowfall is an homage. Um, you know, it was a video in the background, parallax scrolling, all of this was sort of introduced in this one item. So, and if you were just price, if you were just thinking about price consciousness, um, the, this incredible uh, work would not exist. So long story short, avoid using them. <laughs> Okay, enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, totally kidding. Um, no, it, it, the, the, let's really think about it, because often, you know, we work with a lot of government, nonprofit, higher ed, there's procurement offices, they're not going to let you get around the RFP process, you really do have to work within the system. So I think the best thing to do is look at what's the purpose of an RFP? Like, why do you actually want to do this? And, you know, I'm gonna state the obvious, but you wanna select a great partner. You wanna find the person that is the absolute right fit for your, your project, um, and 
by doing, in so doing, you actually can produce this artifact, this, this document that codifies the problems you need to solve. And by having this artifact, I think one thing that's really great is that you can get the various stakeholders, like the stakeholders that aren't gonna check in until the thing launches, you can actually get them on board prior to getting started. So I think that's, that's uh, one really big value of creating this RFP. And finally, is you wanna set your project up for success. And by the way, I just realized that I am not used to talking on a mic and I'm just like, the, the P sounds are killing me up here, so I apologize. Um, so anyway, we wanna codify the project, we wanna set it up for success, we wanna select a great partner. And I wanna look, talk about this through the lens of Van Halen. Um, I'm gonna just pivot over here. It, stay with me for a second. You remember these guys back in the 80s? Uh, this is, they had, uh, back then, they, they, they did these massive tours, wall of amplifiers, lasers, and all of this. David Lee Roth, like, flying all around the, the, the arena. And so they, they had this, like, 90-page writer. I think everybody knows the story about the, the brilliant idea they had, which is, they said, you know, in the dressing room, take out all the brown M&Ms. They buried this on, like, page 67 of a 90-page writer. And so that what they did was, the idea is, is that they go to the dressing room, if they see brown M&Ms, they know something's wrong, they go into panic mode and check all the, all the rigging and what have you. But is, was this actually a brilliant idea? Um, I have an actual picture of their dressing room. This is David Lee Roth standing in front of five bottles of whiskey wearing chaps, I think. Um, not safe for work. Uh, so ultimately, this wasn't a good idea, this is clever. And this is a clever trick that buried essential requirements. I would rather have somebody checking the rigging rather than pulling the brown M&Ms out of that bowl. I would rather have somebody actually making sure that those amps aren't gonna fall on me. Um, and that is the Van Halen thing, but I think today the RFP, like legalese can bury your essential requirements. The boilerplate that's required by a procurement team can bury your essential requirements. Sometimes stakeholders that have like uh, strong opinions about their niche can have their non-essential requirements bury the essential requirements. And so I think there's a few things to think about before actually issuing this document. And I'm gonna say, again, my job here today is just to state the obvious, uh, and that's just to do homework. And the homework involves specifically is getting key, making sure that the key stakeholders that are gonna have an opinion on this project see what you're going to issue before it's, it's sent out. Make sure that they weigh in um, I think the other is, is to pre-qualify people you want to work with. The publicly posted uh, uh, RFPs will get like 30 responses from people who are so, are not busy enough to ignore your RFP. So pre-qualifying vendors, finding like the five or six people that you want to work with is a great way to get started. And I think the last thing is, you know, RFPs have a great, is when you're sort of doing ideation on a project, it's really easy to like have that project expand and expand. And I think it's a really good idea to break up monolithic projects into small, discrete projects. So like, uh, for example, you see this a lot where somebody's like, we need to redo the website. Oh, but we should really think about our messaging, which leads to, let's talk about a brand conversation. That is, um, these are three different projects that might be well served to break down. You can use the same vendor for them in, in a lot of cases, but I think it's a good idea you can use us, uh, but it's, <laughs> uh, all of that being said, uh, it's good to, they did break it down. So let's just talk a little bit about what should be in an RFP, what things that I look for when I'm reading them, when I'm scanning, I get about 15 across my desk every week, and the things that I'm scanning if for is I wanna know about the project background, I wanna really understand, you know, what's your organization's mission, and I'm not talking about like, you know, the entire, uh, the, the book on this, but like, a, like a, a couple of paragraphs on like what, the history of the organization is and what you're, who you're trying to serve. The history of the project in, in particular is if it's a website, is this a uh, greenfield, new website that, that's just coming into existence, is this a migration, you know, what was the purpose for it? And ultimately, why is this project important? You know, is, is, why are we actually uh, making this a significant investment of time and energy? Um, and then the last is, is why would users care about the thing that we're gonna build? It's something outrageous, a uh, number of digital projects fail. It's just about 40%, uh, and in that failure is a lot of projects that launch with all the features and you know fully featured projects that just never get used, that they don't find an audience. So 
I think the second is to make things that need to be in the RFPs to make requirements very clear. It's going back to the Van Halen example. It, you know, I think uh, I initially wrote this as what would be the features of the project, but I think more important is what are the outcomes? You know, what, it, what, what purpose does this serve? What are your priorities? So ultimately, a lot of organizations we work with have uh, competing stakeholder groups, and some want to uh, promote events, some want to collect donations. Uh, what's more important? Like, how does this, you know, that will help inform a project plan. The next is scoring metrics, you know. Is price of, of the, is price the most important thing, or is there something else that's really critical? Uh, actually sharing, like, that gives a sense of what is important to you. And the last one, and I think this is really key, is that prescriptive solutions can be limiting. I spoke with a client a few years ago, and they said, one of the requirements is that we need to have six images in our carousel on the home page, uh, which is a very prescriptive solution, which also uh, uh, sort of glosses over the accessibility issues you run in a car into a carousel, the, pay the page data payload that, would, that that would add, and then finally, the actual user uh, analytics that show that less than 1% of users actually interact with the carousel. It doesn't actually do the thing that it's supposed to do. So having a very prescriptive approach to the problems you're trying to solve um, is, is it's sometimes it's really good to bring in a vendor to, to, to sort of help uh, codify those issues together as a part of the project. I think the next thing that needs to be in this RFP is the timeline. What is your timeline and why is this important to the project? In particular, uh, I think a lot of RFPs do this. They're very clear about the submission deadlines. Um, you know, these are when you, the questions are due. This is when the vendor call is. This is when the proposal is due. Um, but I think the second is the project timeline, you know, and what, what is it and why is it being, why is this important? Is it being driven by a, a procurement campaign? We work with a lot of uh, nonprofits again, so the fiscal year uh, funding is really important or grant funding is really important. Um, and then finally is, is the timeline being informed by the level of effort? So it's not uncommon where the timeline's 12 months for a three month project or the timeline's nine weeks for a 12 month project. Um, Having some, and this goes back to pre-qualifying vendors having some calls and getting uh, getting a sense of what the timeline might be. This is something that I really think is important and might not be un un completely obvious: is to separate the requirements of the project, the timeline of the project, from the boilerplate that you're required to include in an RFP. And specifically, first, don't assume that it's necessary. I think the best uh, pro processes I've gone through are when I've been handed a four to six page spec sheet of things that need to be done um, and without any of the boilerplate. But again, you, sometimes you have to include the sample contract. There's a lot of language that needs to be included. And this language doesn't change from RFP to RFP. So, and, and maybe you're familiar with this, you'll get a document that has like all the boilerplate and then like insert scope here and then more boilerplate, insert timeline here. In those instances, make liberal use of appendices. Uh, just make your RFP boi all boilerplate, and Appendix A is the scope of work, and Appendix B is the timeline. Um, this is just really easy for, it makes it really easy for great vendors to scan your, your document very quickly and qualify it, say, this is a good fit for me. And this is, um, I've got two more things here on this, on this. Make the RFP a searchable document. I've seen this a lot where the RFP is issued as a PDF and it's basically like an image of text, um, which makes it impossible for me to, to go like quickly use a search function to go find the budget or the timeline, you know, or some other keywords that I'm interested in. And finally, and I've seen this, if your RFP is a jumble of copy paste, copy pasta from other RFPs, you, the responses are gonna match that tone and that is not valuable, I think, at all. So if you, I've seen RFPs that have like, we need support for three months, and then in the next paragraph, six months, and then six pages later, nine months. Um, that, is, that is clearly being pulled from other documents. Another thing is, that I think is really helpful for me when putting together a project plan is to understand the team I'd be working with. And specifically, who are the team, who's, who's on the team that you're gonna be working with day to day? You know, what are their superpowers? What are they bringing to the table? Do you have in-house development? Maybe you don't need 
a, a heavy lift on development, or maybe you have a designer or somebody who's creating a lot of content for you, so you don't need the automated migration. Um, that's really helpful to know. It's also really helpful to know to how much of their time will be dedicated to the project. You know, some partners that you choose to work with will be people who, you know, uh, uh, you hand requirements to and they squirrel themselves away and they deliver something months later. That's not how we operate. And so it's really important for us to understand, like, how much time are you actually, do you have, are you giving to this project? And that will inform the project plan. And lastly, never share your budget, ever. Totally kidding. Totally share your budget. Tell the people how much you're actually going to spend on this uh, project. I think that there's this, um, there's a perception that if you, if you share what your budget is, all of your vendors are going to go straight to the top of your budget. And that might be the case, but the issue here is it isn't that you need to do an apples to apples comparison. And so it'd be, it's very good to let people know how much you have to spend. Um, if, if you're a project manager, maybe you're familiar with the iron triangle of you know, scope, budget, and timeline, which all uh, uh, rolls up into quality. If you don't share the budget, the problem is, is that you don't really get a sense of what the quality of the work is going to be. So why share this budget? It just right sizes the project plans and proposals. If you have a big budget, maybe you want it to do workshops. You want to think, think, do a deep dive. If you're working with a small budget, maybe you need to have something that is more off the shelf. And then also you get to judge, you take the budget out of the equation and you judge on the quality of the plan and the experience of the team and not just the price. All right, I'm going to try to get through the last piece very quickly on the takeaways. Um, if you can help it, don't use an RFP. Big first takeaway. If you must use an RFP, organize it well. In some sections, uh, there's somebody, one of our clients here, who issued the RFP that basically told me how to put this slide together, is first start with a summary, an overview of the RFP project, the organization background, the project background, including goals, what you know about your audience and your analytics. Uh, team information, oh, I'm, I'm ahead. Team information, like who's on your team, how much of the time is on the project, what are their superpowers? Is the scope of work, the iron triangle of uh, deliverables, timeline, budget, and boilerplate. If you have boilerplate, uh, either use it, skip it, attach it as an appendix, appendices. And that is the everything I have to say about that. So thank you all. I'm willing to take Let's do questions. Let's let's open the floor. We have ten minutes. So you're asking, is there a way of simplifying? I'm sorry, maybe I don't understand the question. Okay, so in this instance, so the, 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 the I, have to, I, have to, I have instructions to repeat this on the mic. <laughs> um, okay, so, the, so you, had a, you issued an RFP for a certain amount. Uh, uh, responses came back and said, this, it, we can meet that in Drupal. We can bring it, come in a little bit less in WordPress. Um, but your capacity was, it was in Drupal. Um, and so I think that's actually, uh, that is a part of, the, I, would, I would consider that a part of the requirements piece, that it is Drupal, to say we have a strong preference for Drupal. Now, I'm not, um, I know there's DrupalCon, so I might need to whisper this, but I'm not like a Drupal 
priest. Like I don't like swing the incense at home or have an altar uh, for Drupal. I'm I I want to work with the, I think of it as a hammer, and you know if I need to drive a nail, that's the best tool. Um, if a vendor comes back and says, "Hey, we've got WordPress. We can do WordPress with for 85 percent less," I would I would be hard pressed to go with Drupal. Now, with the amount you're talking about, which is like a five percent difference, um, that is if you think about it over time, like the, the amount of time that you the amount of the cost to actually support that would be more than offset by the savings because if you have internal capacity for Drupal and you don't have like the WordPress capacity, then that becomes problematic for your organization. I would I would always include the budget range is, is fantastic. Um, I think that you know it's it's uh, I think that gives a sense that of what is like you know it, at the minimum you know at the minimum is like we know this is going to be at least I don't know sixty thousand dollars and if you come in at fifteen thousand dollars we know you're not serious. Um, that's that is I think and then at the maximum to say this is the absolute must, most we can spend then that becomes a question of you know how do you have guardrails in the project to make sure you're not going to go over that. Uh, does that make sense? I, I, I think a range is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Sure, so you're asking about how to pre-qualify vendors without like prejudicing other vendors. Um, so. Uh, that is, that's a great question, and I think there's a few different things. There's a lot of resources. I know this is gonna be totally self-serving, but that's fine. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm from New York City. I'm totally fine with being self-serving. Uh, no, I think that the, uh, like, uh, on the uh, Drupal.d.o marketplace has a bunch of, like, like really qualified Drupal vendors, and Clutch.co uh, has a, uh, also a number of listing of Drupal vendors, and that's a great place to start the conversation. With respect to having those conversations, um, especially when you're in a re regulatory environment, those conversations really have to start before the RFP is issued. And that is, because uh, once the RFP is issued, then I think a lot of times that's when the gates close and you can't talk to people. In those instances, it's just good to reach out and get a sense for the people you'd be working with and just have a conversation. And um, in those instances, it, w it's, it just helps you to understand, like, uh, to, to get a sense of what that project is being, how that project is being uh, seen on the agency side, and it also helps to get a sense of what is, how you can um, write an RFP in a way that would be welcomed by the agencies that you prefer. Um, does that make sense? So there's a question about policy. Sometimes you have uh, policies that prevent you from doing th something like sharing the budget, for example. Um, and uh, how can how can you work within that system, or how can you change that system? Changing the system feels a little bit more like above my pay grade. I, I one of the things I reason why I wanted to give this talk is because you know there's a lot of there's been uh, like six or seven years ago there's a lot of talks about like ending the RFP process, and it didn't get any traction. So I said, well, why don't we just try to improve what's there? Um, it, with respect to uh, like how I've seen people work within those sort of constraints um, successfully is when you can't share the budget, uh, require that the budget is, is part of a second round. So like you actually just see a, like a technical proposal without any cost. And then you pick like the three top and then you ask for the cost proposal from there. And the reason is is that you actually eliminate a lot of 
you then you are judging. So you, first of all, you're incentivizing the, the the vendor to just like say this is what we want to do. This is the best we can do. This is the best value for that we see, and then they share the budget with you as a second round. Because otherwise, if you are just saying, well, give us your give us your project plan and the budget together, what happens is is then you're in a competitive environment with 20 different uh, people. And the the cost is the thing that's going to drive it down. I know I'm focusing exclusively on the budget. I'm happy to talk more about other aspects as well. Uh, we've got like two minutes. Is uh, any any final? I mean, I don't want to I don't want to say like final burning thought questions because I feel like that puts too much pressure on it. But any trivial questions? Have I ever seen like a funny RFP? Okay, so uh, no, because every time I see an RFP that's not good, it's like it feels like a it's it's a waste of time for me. <laughs> so no, uh, I I have seen an RFP. I I saw a, a project that had uh, it was an incredibly uh, technical uh, a pro pro project which was like using multiple Pantheon upstreams with multiple API integrations with. Uh, a tie-in to uh, like an internal workflow, uh, and uh, they had eleven thousand dollars. So that was, uh, I was like, "This is a great project. It's really interesting." Until I got to the budget page, and I said, "I should have gotten to the budget page first. <laughs> How do I handle customers without an RFP? That's a great question because I think a lot of times that is that's also challenging because you have to work together to understand uh, like the business requirements and you start at a much higher level. And that is, um, uh, typically what I like to do there is I, I like to introduce them to the Atten team and have them actually work with a strategist to start thinking through the problems that need to be solved. And then that way uh, we have a, you know, we have a strategist that helps them work through the problems that need to be solved and a project manager that can help sort of formulate a project plan for them. And then that way we are starting from a collaborative place. Okay, last question. Sure, so this is a question about change management. Is a software changes as it's sort of coming into focus. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a really interesting. Uh, I know how to, I know how to do that from a proposal perspective, but not from the RFP perspective. I have to follow up with you on that. Anyway, I'm out of time. Thank you so much. This is a really great conversation. Oh. Uh, don't forget to contribute and also uh, give give uh, answer the surveys at the end of the uh, conference. Thank you very much, everybody.